everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's uh, session for Social Determinants of Environmental Health webinar series. Today we have the Blue Marble Librarians, libraries helping their communities prepare for extreme weather and foster socially and ec ecologically conscious culture. Uh, my name is Sarah Levin Letterer, and I am an Outreach and Education Coordinator for Region 7, and I'll be your host today. Assisting with techni technical aspects is Molly Knapp from the NNLM National Training Office, and our chat monitor is April Wright from Region 1. So a few logistical things before I turn it over to our presenters. Um, we have just a few technical items. Uh, we do have a live captioner today, and closed caption has been enabled. And it's available by selecting closed caption at bottom menu. Depending on size of your screen, you may need to click on the three dots where it says more and then select closed captions. All attendees have been muted, but we welcome your questions and comments in the chat anytime. But we will have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. So we will be saving those. April and I will be making note. Um, please be sure to select everyone from the drop down menu when posting your questions and comments in chat so everyone can see them and interact if they have thoughts as well. So before we get started, we're recording today's session and the recording will be available at various places, including the accompanying series guide in about a month. As a reminder, by registering for this webinar, all attendees have agreed to abide by the NNLM code of conduct. It's a reminder that we are all here together professionally and we want to be inclusive and respectful. Your cooperation is appreciated. The code of conduct is also available on our website and the link is in the chat. This class is eligible for one Medical Library Association continuing education credit, which you'll be able to claim through the evalu evaluation link that will have the MLA code. Um, and we will share that at the end of the session. The session is also eligible for um, Consumer Health Information Specialization or CHIS through MLA. Um, and we really appreciate your feedback, even if you aren't uh, getting CEs from this session. Um, your feedback helps us to continue to bring you quality pro, uh, sessions and educational opportunities. So uh, I also wanted to mention who we are so we can sort of situate where this information is coming from. Um, some of you may be familiar with us, but for those who aren't, I'd like to share a little more about who we are. The Na National Institutes of Health is the nation's leading medical research agency. Many of you might be more familiar with the National Cancer Institute, which is one of the many institutes and centers at NIH. NLM, or the National Library of Medicine, is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the NIH. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. And NLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, all providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NLM member organizations. And this is what our regions look like. Um, I'm with Region 7, so I serve New England and New York. Um, but there is an NNLM regional office there for you as well. So if you'd like to learn about NNLM, the link to our website is in the chat. So with that, I'm happy to turn it over to our presenters. Michelle Eberly is a consultant for the Massachusetts Library System a nonprofit which fosters innovation, communication, and collaboration among libraries of all types. Her specializations include strategic planning, consultation, providing professional development, and coordinating statewide public health and mental health partnerships. Serving as one of the leaders of the Blue Marble Librarians has been a great joy for her work at MLS. Madeline Charney is a librarian at the UMass Amherst Libraries her subject areas center on the built, 
slash natural environment and working landscapes. Her climate resilience activism includes learning and teaching practices to weave strong social fabric so we may face the challenges ahead with kindness and creativity. Her favorite pastime lately is growing and sharing med medicinal herbs. She's grateful to all the librarians who have made up the vibrant network that is Blue Marble Librarians. Gabrielle Griffiths works as a youth services librarian at Brewster's Ladies Library. She has been coordinating and advocating for repair events in libraries since 2018, as well as socially and environmentally just, community, just communities since 2016. Her writing on the topic appears in, appears in Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture, Libraries and Sustainability, Programs and Practices for Community Impact, 25 ready to use sustainable living library programs, as well as how public libraries build sustainable communities in the 21st century. She has been a leading member of the Blue Marble Librarian since 2019 and enjoys managing their social media and blog. Corey Farnenkoff is a librarian and writer living on Cape Cod. He is a staff librarian East East Ham Public Library, a member of the Blue Marble Librarians and a crew climate hub advisor. His short stories have been published in numerous venues, including Smoke Long, Quarterly, Catapult, The Southwest Review, Three Lobe Burning Eye, Bourbon Pen, and elsewhere. His debut novel, Living in Cemeteries, will be released from Journal Stone Publishing in April of 2024. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our folks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the introductions. Sarah, and thanks to NNLM for hosting Blue Marble Librarians. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to just um, let you know how we got started. It was with an invitation. I had been doing some work around New England, helping librarians work with their communities to facilitate conversations about climate change. Chris Glass at Boston Public Library caught wind of this called me up on the phone one day and said, would you like to come to the first Climate Preparedness Week in Boston Public Library and present with me to about 15 librarians? Sure, I said. And we gave a presentation and the person in the room that was organizing with crew, communities responding to extreme weather, you're gonna hear about them more later from Michelle, he said, gee, librarians sure have it going on. We should do more stuff with you. And so Chris and I got in touch with Michelle. Now, Michelle, I had met you at one of my, in my travels around New England. I had done a workshop with you through MLS. And the three of us started putting our heads together. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And um, we've already been introduced, and it's nice to see people putting who they are in the chat. So keep on doing that. And over to you, Michelle. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be here with you today. Um, so I'd like to recognize Madeline Charney for her work through the years on climate preparedness, uh, for generating this collaboration, and for serving as a leader and advisor for the Blue Marble Librarians. Uh, Madeline's an innovator and one of the first librarians who mobilized the library profession to get involved with sustainability. So with our Blue Marble Librarian collaboration, um, she coordinated a um, regenerative change training for us with Abra Dresdale. Um, and she introduced us to sociocracy, which is a shared leadership model for meetings. Um, I can't say enough about Madeline, and Madeline is a leader with mindfulness for libraries. And today's webinar will wrap up with a mindfulness activity um, to nourish ourselves to do this important work. So I'd also like to recognize um, Sarah Levin Letterer, Education and Outreach Coordinator for the NNLM Region 7, for her active participation with the Blue Marble Librarians. Um, she has regularly attended our meetings and provided updates about NNLM grant opportunities. And so we greatly appreciate Sarah's participation. Um, so through our partnership with Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, which Madeline shared is a nonprofit, um, that also their acronym is CREW. Um, Massachusetts libraries have offered hundreds of libraries programs in the past five years. Um, we've also promoted their Climate Resilience Hub program. Um, and so stay tuned to hear more 
from Gabriel Griffiths and Corey Ferenkopf about the Climate Prep Week and Climate Resilience Hubs. Um, so our collaboration has sparked other collaborations, including the Pioneer Valley Library Collaborative in Massachusetts around Climate Prep Week. So at the heart of the Blue Marble Librarians is the desire to be a change agent, an activist, and to prepare our communities for the extreme weather that we're experiencing. Um, our name is inspired by the Blue Marble image, um, which is the first image of Earth taken from the Apollo satellite, and it generated a great awe and reverence for the planet. Um, and so our work really aims to generate this feeling of love and appreciation for our planet, um, to care for our environment, and to create a feeling of interconnectedness, to connect each other, to care for each other. So as a former NNLM coordinator, I'm very passionate about public health, um, and I view the provision of information and library services through the um, det social determinants of health lens. Um, I'm driven to be an activist to increase access to information and library services to help our communities thrive and support wellness. Um, so collective care is more important now than ever as we emerge out of the pandemic and through climate chaos. Um, so keeping in mind the Healthy People 2030 definition of the social determinants of environmental health, um, as the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age um, that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, I invite you to share in the chat um, what motivates you to support the social determinants of environmental health or what motivates you to take action to improve the conditions of people's environment. So I've heard at many public health conferences um, that the greatest factor in people's health is their zip code, um, which speaks a lot to the importance of local action um, and what's in every zip code of public library. So I invite you, if you like, to share um, what motivates you in the chat. And so thank you for starting getting that going, Sandy. Um, at the Blue Marble Librarians, we have a new mission um, we are evolving from focusing on Climate Prep Week to provide more support for Massachusetts libraries to connect with each other and to collaborate on climate change resilience and community building. Um, so here's our new mission, a network of Massachusetts library workers committed to climate change resilience and community building. Um, so our mission supports the social determinants of environmental health. Um, the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit defines resilience as the capacity of a community business or natural environment to prevent, withstand, respond to, and recover from a disruption. So the Blue Marble Librarians are one of the earlier library climate change collaborations. Uh, over five years ago, we started offering webinars on how to get involved with Climate Prep Week and Climate Resilience Hubs. Um, and we hosted a Climate Resilience series for libraries, which is available to view as a showcase on the Massachusetts Library System Vimeo channel. Um, and April shared the link in the chat for you. Um, one of the highlights of my experience as a Blue Marble Librarian um, was hosting a Climate Prep Central event with David Pogue, um, highlighting his book, How to Prepare for Climate Change, A Guide to Surviving the Chaos. Um, Pogue is a CBS Sunday Morning News correspondent and a prolific author, and he was super excited to work with us. Um, we developed book discussions with him, which are available on our guide. And libraries across the Commonwealth hosted book discussions, um, and he attended several of these book discussions on Zoom at no cost to the libraries. And we had a very entertaining moment with him when he logged into a Zoom to plan the book discussions with us while riding a bike uh, during a family vacation in Vermont. So it was wonderful. We've had some fun times together. And so we put together a guide. Um, we developed a guide to promote Climate Prep Week, and the guide includes program ideas, how to get involved with how to get involved with Climate Prep Week, book lists for youth and adults, um, the Pogue book discussion materials, and a history of the Blue Marble Librarians, and more. Um, so April shared the link in the chat for you. And a couple of years into our collaboration, we wanted to share more climate resilience success stories and de decided to develop a blog. Um, we have a Blue Marble Library blog, and on the guide, it's basically become the centerpiece of our guide. 
Um, Gabrielle Griffiths is the lead on the blog. Um, she recruits librarians to write posts. And Gabrielle has done an outstanding job and does this as volunteer work on her, her per personal time. Um, Gabrielle, and Gr Gabrielle Griffiths and Corey Ferenkoff are two of the most productive and consistently devoted contributors and leaders with the Blue Marble Librarians. Um, they are two of the most kind, generous, and amazing librarians and leaders in sharing resources and best practices with climate preparedness and sustainability for libraries. Um, so now I'm gonna pass the mic over to Gabrielle and she's gonna fill you in on some more of our resources. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having um, us today. And thank you so much, Michelle and Madeline for such beautiful introductions. And really uh, Corey and I, and speaking for myself, um, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for these two. So it really has been a, a pleasure and a pr privilege to get to work um, with everyone who's involved in the Blue Marble Librarian. So today I'm just going to speak a little bit about some of the outreach efforts that I have um, contributed to for our Blue Marble Library Librarian group. And um, the screen that you see is for the um, the YouTube channel, which just is highlighting some of the initiatives and the events that we've hosted, um, but is no in no way comprehensive. And one of the things that I'm really thrilled to share is that um, one of the series that we did in 2020 was a series called The Economics of Sustainability, which was hosted by uh, Northeastern economics professor Madhavi Venkatesan, and Madhavi was just named as um, one of US T USA Today's um, most influential women in the country for her work um, as a climate ad advocate and activist, and her work um, with her nonprofit that she, she founded, um, Sustainable Practices. And if you look up plastic bottle bans, you will see um, Madhavi's name uh, and all the work that she's done. So it was a pleasure to be able to um, collaborate with her. And so this six part series that we did with her um, on the economics of sustainability is available on YouTube, uh, which you can watch. And one of the last things I'll say about that series that I really loved is that it really gets to the heart, right, of, um, environmental justice, which is intersectional and really uh, fundamentally, I think for all of us is, is the question, which is what are our values um, and really centering people and our environment um, and the work that we do. So certainly check out our YouTube channel and subscribe to it. And then in the next slide, you, you'll get to see uh, just some examples of the social media outreach that um, I've had the privilege of getting to, um, to do over the past number of years. And the purpose of this social media is really just to highlight and showcase and inspire librarians um, to find ways to creatively advocate and implement climate-related programming, environmental-related programming, social justice-oriented programming. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, but also I think speaking for a lot of us here today, the Blue Marble Librarians really emerged out of a deep desire to do to do work that maybe we did not see being done at a grassroots level and integrating um, a more holistic approach uh, to library services. And so um, certainly if you are on social media, please follow our, our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, or just have a look uh, if that's not your thing. <laughs> um, but you'll see, the announcement of different blog posts. You'll see all sorts of different programs that are being highlighted. And uh, speaking for, for myself, um, since 2018, I have been very involved in repair events, um, which are, um, and I'd be really interested actually, if anybody here has heard of like a repair cafe or a fix-it clinic, because we've been trying to um, just advocate for these events, which, kind of embody so much of, of the work that we're trying to do. But um, 
but yeah, so in any case, I've been advocating for repair events and coordinating them since 2018. Um, and it's just an example of a an intergenerational program in which people come to the library with their broken stuff to be guided by a repair coach with fixing skills to hopefully fix their broken things. And it really is sort of a multi-level approach to, um, you know, all kinds of different um, social, environmental uh, issues. So in any case, the social media exists to, as I said before, to just make people aware of programs that maybe they hadn't been thinking of or to give them ideas or, you know, to encourage us to keep the conversation going. Because if we don't change the narrative and if we don't keep talking about um, social and environmental justice, um, it's so easy for us to to fall back or to slip back into um I hate to use the word like apathy or whatever, but you know, it, it it's um there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of change that's needed. So in any case, um that's just a little bit of the work that I have been um responsible for. And it's been one of my greatest pleasures and privileges to just advocate for for all of that work so i'm going to give it back to michelle and you'll hear from me later and gabrielle has done a phenomenal job on the social media so definitely follow us um, on facebook twitter and instagram um, so blue marble librarians have been featured in the local news and in massachusetts this has been um, very helpful for advocacy for public libraries so I'm just going to highlight a couple of the stories. Um, so Gabrielle Griffiths was featured on the Lower Cape News speaking about the Climate Resilience Hubs project. Um, Laura Gardner, a school librarian at the Dartmouth Middle School, was featured on a Massachusetts School Library Association podcast. Um, Clayton Cheever, director at the library in Norwood, um, was featured on a Boston Neighborhood Network News program. Rainey Cunningham, librarian at the Concord Free Public Library, who is joining the Blue Marble Librarian's leadership team this spring, uh, was featured in a video testimonial. And Corey Ferenkoff was featured in the local news story about the Sturgis Library's rain garden. So we've got a lot of good local press um, for our group. And so where are we going next? Um, moving forward, rather than having a core group of Blue Marble Librarians, our meetings will be announced on the Massachusetts Library System's Blue Marble Listserv. Um, and if you are a library worker interested in climate resilience and community building in Massachusetts, then you are a Blue Marble Librarian. And we'd love to have you join us for our meetings. So, you know, with extreme weather, with the weather we're experiencing, we need to envision a new future and look at new ways that we can sustain and heal the environment and ourselves, um, new ways to support each other. Um, and the Blue Marble Librarian's work and our mission supports this. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic back to Gabrielle, and Gabrielle's going to cover a little bit more depth on Climate Prep Week. Yay, I'm back. Um, yeah, so Climate Preparedness Week, as Madeline had mentioned early in the beginning, emerged as a partnership. Um, well, I should say the library aspect, this evolved as a, as a partnership so Communities Responding to Extreme Weather is a, a grassroots, uh, Boston-based grassroots organization um, that's a part of the Better Future Project. And as Madeline had mentioned, Chris Glass was involved with this, um, this organization. And after reviewing Boston's Municipal Vulnerability Plan, um, recognized that the library had a greater role to play. And, um, and so that was when... Um, I think he reached out to to Madeline and, and and Michelle, and so I got involved in Climate Preparedness Week because of um, these wonderful folks, and was invited to a focus group um, to a working meeting in 2019 um, in Worcester, at uh, I believe it was the UMass um, Medical Campus, and that was the the origin of when we were working on essentially getting libraries to to host climate preparedness week programs so if we go to the next slide um it will give you 
a little bit of a better picture of what that actually looks like. So Climate Preparedness Week takes pl place each September, usually between September 24th and the 30th. And it is a week of service and action that is dedicated to um, organizations hosting programs to better prepare their communities for extreme weather events. So um, this, these types of events take many forms, and it's not just libraries actually that can host Climate Prep Week programs, um, but this partnership emerged um, because libraries, um, especially in Massachusetts, are incredibly well connected, and um, the Madeline and Michelle and Chris saw that there was a great opportunity um, to to reach out to libraries and the role that they could play. So. Basically, um, the first year in 2019, uh, there was a lot of um, sort of emails that <laughs> went out and um, informational sessions that were coordinated and organized. And I myself was responsible for um, my library network system, which is Cape, uh, Cape Cod. So the, the CLAMS library system here, uh, which is about 38 libraries. And so really trying to get um, libraries to sign up to host Climate Prep Week programs um, throughout that week and really to take on, um, you know, not just isolating these events necessarily to one week, but throughout the year. So if we go to... Well, actually, I just want to speak to this slide. So what you're seeing here on the screen is um, one is a map of all of the libraries um, that either partnered or hosted um, a Climate Preparedness Week program. Um, I believe the first year it was over 119 libraries. And the other um, image that you're looking at is uh, just a cur curated books, books that I had um put together uh, for, for libraries to either curate for, for their, um, for their library or, um, you know, to share. So now we can go to the next slide. So um, examples of cl climate preparedness week programs here are just some sort of climate related programs. They're not necessarily directly focused on extreme weather preparedness. Um, so we've got, um, Obviously, the Fix-It Clinic's a gardening workshop and a, um, a boomerang bags, which is a sewing group, which is sewing upcycled bags um, out of post-consumer fabrics as an alternative to uh, plastic, single-use plastic bags. Um, we go to the next slide. <laughs> I think, yeah. So this is um, a really great example of um, one of the Climate Prep Week initiatives that was done at the Concord Free Public Library by one of our members, uh, Rainey Cunningham, who is just a really amazing member, which is the Climate Ribbon Project event um, and some of the initiatives that they did during Climate Prep Week. And um, these events, um, effectively, I would say, um, are a really great opportunity <laughs> for libraries to introduce conversations about climate preparedness, but we also do programs that deal really directly uh, with extreme weather. So for example, uh, some of the programs that I've hosted with my libraries include um, like flood insurance preparedness. Um, like we had someone from the Barnstable County, um, the Cape Cod Extension, um, they're a flood specialist uh, do an event on on flood insurance and that was a, just a really great event we've also had um, extreme weather preparedness programs storm preparedness um, events and Corey is going to speak a little bit more to cruise climate resilience hub program um, which will put climate prep week a little bit more into context um, but but basically the the short of it is is climate prep week programs can take on so many different um, sort of shapes and iterations, and they can be passive, they can be interactive. Um, but the real goal, the real purpose of, of Climate Prep Week is to get those conversations started and to, you know, do something to get um, our communities engaged and thinking about how to just best prepare for, 
for extreme weather, whether it's creating emergency kits or doing flood insurance. Um, it, there are just kind of like limitless possibilities. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and I think, I don't know if Michelle, you wanted to speak to this slide or if I should. I think I might just pass it back to you. <laughs> oh, sure. So we did cover a lot of this on the slide already, but we'd yeah. love to have you follow us on social media. Um, so we'll put a link in the chat where you can find um, all the links to our social media on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Oh, sorry for my video on. And so also, um, if you're interested to get involved with Climate Prep Week, um, it is in September, September 24th to 30th. Um, and you can host a program uh, for Climate Prep Week and be featured on the Communities Responding to Extreme Weather map. Um, and we also just encourage you to check out our blog um, for ideas for Climate Prep Week, for ideas for sustainability, for um, just all anything climate related. Um, we'd also love to share your stories. So if you'd like to be featured in the blog, um, please reach out to Gabriel or me, and we'd love to highlight the work that you're doing um, in your communities. And so now I'm going to uh, turn it back to Gabrielle. We, we had another slide about the blog. Here's some stories that we have recently posted. Yes. So if you would like to be featured um, for your work uh, related to cl climate preparedness um, and environmentalism, or you have something you want to share, definitely reach out to either me or Michelle. Um, and also just check out the Blue Marble Library blog um, because we've had just so many really extraordinary uh, library professionals write very inspiring and informative posts um, about all sorts of ways in which libraries can, um, you know, just promote and embody sustainability and um, and just work towards those goals. Um, and, you know, just as I've said before, um, it really has been and really is a, such a pleasure and a privilege to, to get to do this work. Um, and knowing that it highlights and helps others, um, because the, the work that we're doing, I feel like can be, um, very overwhelming and sometimes very lonely. Um, so to be able to connect with other professionals who care and feel as deeply as we do about, um, social and environmental justice, um, it always just lifts my spirits and makes my heart sing when people uh, reach out and write blog posts and we get to share and there's just conversation. Um, I believe there's a, a great ripple effect that happens when we start to express uh, this kind of um, work. So I think that is it for me. And I'm going to pass it over to Corey. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about Climate Resilience Hubs, which are uh, essentially an initiative put forth by FRU, and it's really connected to Climate Prep Week. So you're going to see how all that kind of feeds into that. Next slide, please. So what are Climate Hubs? Uh, it's very simple. It's basically like on the, like the most minute level. It is a place where people can go to get information about extreme weather preparedness, like what they can do in the face of it. Um, and that's like kind of very basic, but the idea of what a climate uh, uh, a climate hub is is there's like different levels. So originally, when they were started by Crew, there were three levels. The first level was basically you were a place where you housed information uh, that Crew would give you, and that also you would supply on different types of extreme weather. So they would give you handouts and pamphlets and literature on uh, droughts, on hurricanes, on flooding, on wildfires. We're in Massachusetts, we don't really get a lot of wildfires out here, thankfully, um, but they, if you were to join with them, you would kind of let them know what you're interested in. So level one does that. Um, they also get put on a map that says, hey, we're a climate hub. Um, you can come here for information and we can connect you to other climate hubs or other organizations that are doing this work. Um, so you would do that and do that. And then level two uh, is where it gets a little more complicated. So level two of a climate hub is a place that is has the ability to kind of do like partial shelter 
help essentially in extreme weather crises, crises. Um, and that would be like, can you be a heating station? Can you be a cooling station? Uh, are you a charging station? Do you have like resources? So if um, like your town is out of power, like do you have a generator to your space and can people come stay there for a little while? So that was level two. And then level three is like full shelter, uh, which is very difficult to do as like a retrofitted sort of thing. And a lot of libraries would have issues like getting that to work. Uh, but that was the original idea of what a crew hub was going to be. Um, but recently they've been switching away from that because uh, level three is almost like impossible to do unless you were like planning that ahead of time. So right now what crew like is doing for climate hubs is uh, it's instead of there being tiers, you're just a climate hub and you can do any level of what you're doing or have the ability to do. And that's great. Um, but right now their requirements are you display a decal from them, which it's just a cool little, uh, you'll see in the next slide, actually. It's a cool little decal you put on a window. Um, you have to do one program for climate prep week. It's actually like in a farther slide. You can just go back. <laughs> Um, you have to do one program for climate prep week and you have to have local EMS resources. So basically if you want to be a climate hub, uh, you would either you yourself would go out and gather like your local fire and police and extreme weather preparedness groups and like who we, would you contact in certain instances and have that readily available for your patrons. Um, but if you don't have the ability to do that, crew will work with you in order to gather that information. So they will help you put together your list, which is great. Um, and so the program for Climate Prep Week, that is the other requirement to be a hub. Uh, and as Gabrielle was saying, it's that week-long um, celebration or educational spree of sorts where people get to learn about like environmental programming and extreme weather preparedness. Uh, so basically, you have to do one program during that time. Uh, you, as a library on your own, can do that program, but you can also sign on for central events that, um, that either Crew puts on or Blue Marble Librarians put on. Um, and as long as you advertise that event and like get that out to your patrons and community, it, like it counts towards your um, event and it kind of fulfills that and it, it's great. So there's been lots of cool uh, central events back in the day. Um, climate hubs are not always libraries, you know, like libraries are a lot of them, but also churches do it. Nonprofits do it. Some local businesses do it. Um, oh, and also some colleges have signed on for it, which is really cool. So you have those different things going on. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So as I was saying, when you become a climate hub, you get access to a bunch of literature that's been vetted and put together by crew. Um, they'll either send it to you, they'll print a bunch of it out and send it to you, or they'll just send you the files and you can print it out yourself if you need to fill in. Um, and that's pretty great. And when you're a climate hub, you basically want to have like a display space for this stuff. So in our like entrance way like the vestibule to get into the east ham library we have all of our stuff set up on a little table it's all clearly labeled it's all just like take what you need and as things get low i like go and refill them so it's like pretty once you get it established it's like not too much to think about for the most part um so you get the literature which is great but it also gives you like a sense of community and uh community within like your local area and then community nationally so because here at East Ham Library, we're a climate hub. We are in communication with the other libraries on Cape Cod about different environmental programs, sustainability programming, um, extreme weather programming, and we kind of bounce ideas off each other. And uh, because one library knows that another library is part of this initiative, like they're more likely to reach out to them for like help and to like share ideas and to bounce ideas around. Um, but being a climate hub, it also gives you access to the crew monthly and bi-monthly meetings. Uh, right now, crew's going through a little bit of a change, so they're sh they're redoing like their methods and time frame for stuff. So it might be bi monthly meetings moving forward. But what it is is, if you're a climate hub, there is monthly meetings where you can show up and ask questions about what people are doing, do idea shares. Um, if you're having issues trying to figure out what to do for climate prep week, uh, they'll help you out with that, which is great. And it's just like a group of people who really care about this stuff. So it's really nice to just like be in conversation with other people who are doing the work. Uh, so there's that. What else do we got that's important? So in the past, crew for Climate Prep Week and before that has also like sent out speakers to do different things. So I would say this was like pre-shutdown or pre-lockdown. They sent out one of their, um, their they have, um, 
they have what are they called like yearly fellowship people who come and work for them and they sent someone out to do a program at my old library sturgis library on sea level rise and that was great like they had a person who just like came out and did it and that worked i don't know if they're doing it now i think they probably want to get back to that eventually but again they're going through kind of like a restructuring phase um yeah so next slide please so as I was saying, the decal, you'll see the decal over there that is on the front window of East Ham Library. Uh, you just have to put it somewhere visible. Um, it can be on an outward facing window, it can be on your door, um, and they come in different sizes. So they like help you out with that. If you have like a tiny little space, they'll manage it. And then the other image is from Brewster Ladies Library where Gabrielle works. And that is the, her display of all of like the crew um, literature but also other literature that she's gathered from local nonprofits, from the town um, from other organizations involved in extreme weather preparedness and like sustainability stuff uh, so that's pretty great and again it's like every library is going to have different resources they need so when you have a space like this you can also fill it with uh, stuff from other organizations that you you think your patrons need and it can also be like mental health resources i meant to say that earlier crew also offers um, information about uh, how climate change and how extreme weather affect mental health. So they have good resources on that as well. Uh, next slide, please. So community partners. So through being a, a crew hub, it kind of also opens up like a dialogue with people in your community about uh, what your library is doing for environmental programming, for sustainability programming, extreme weather programming. Um, and like a lot of people in different communities now know of uh, the the phrase climate hubs so like it automatically kind of like sparks something in people's brains uh, so I would say how do I want to phrase this a lot of people have reached out to me about different involvement with this sort of thing uh, and I've been able to put them in contact with local nonprofits that have been able to like provide programming for their either climate prep week stuff or non-climate prep week stuff uh, so that's like another big part of being a climate hub is just like the connection and uh, the kind of like, I don't like web of influence almost where you can basically like help people navigate to other resources that'll like really help them out. Um, and another thing to think about when you're looking at this is, so here in East End, we have a climate action committee. We have a recycling committee. We have a few other committees that are involved in like offshoots of that. There's like a solar planning thing going on. We have like a composting committee. And because we're a climate hub, they know that we're involved in that. So we oftentimes do like partnerships with them on programming. Uh, and we're both working towards the same goal, which is really great. So, like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again and again. You can uh, rely on people who have been doing these kind of programming programs for a while, uh, which is really great and convenient. And, again, very helpful for Climate Prep Week. If you're like, I need a program, these people have a program they can give. And they already want to do that kind of stuff anyway. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so last thing I'm going to talk about is Hub Advisors. Hub Advisors are um, myself. Leroy Harris and Margaret Woodruff, those are our emails. Uh, so we're people who've been working with the hub system for like a number of years, and we are the points of contact for people who are looking to get involved with it, um, looking to sign up, or just like trying to get more information. Uh, so if you ever need to reach out and have questions about it, feel free to let us know. You can also go to Cruise website to find more information. Um, the process of becoming a hub is, you, it's pretty straightforward. It's basically you just, uh, there's a couple of forms you fill out and the forms basically just say, like, I'll do the things that Corey mentioned in the earlier slides. Uh, and you usually have to get your director to sign off on it. So some, depending on what kind of library you work for and the processes and policies there, uh, you might have to get your trustees to get on board with it, your, your board to get on board with it. Uh, sometimes it's just your director. There's all sorts of different things that go into that. Um, and oftentimes when... Uh, either trustees have questions or directors of libraries have questions, they will reach out to one of the three of us to, to talk about it. And I'm always happy to like go over those, the kind of like the overview of what a hub is and the requirements and stuff uh, and to fill in any kind of information on that. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's all I have on climate hubs. So hopefully it was informative. And if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out. You send me an email and I will get back to you. So back to, we're going to Madeline now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, 
let's take a moment to get back in our bodies and just um, maybe you've been sitting for a while. If you want to stand up, this is a one and a half minute stretch break. So just take care of yourselves. That's part of doing this work is sustaining ourselves. So I invite you to take a little stretch, take a sip of tea, take your eyes off the screen, look outside, stretch your eye muscles, look to the horizon. We don't tend to do that often enough in this culture. And then before we reconvene, um, I'm going to go into a little bit about the mental health impacts of climate change, but just take a moment and let an image arise right now for yourself of something you're grateful for, something that might have happened today or some part of your life. And if you would like to just share in the chat a moment of gratitude, anything little or big, because that really does tend to fuel me, I know, maybe that helps you too to keep perspective in life, something you're grateful for. And take a minute and we can appreciate each other's lives and moments big and small. And I'm really grateful for people showing up these days so engaged already. When these workshops used to happen even a few years ago, people were paralyzed. They were just like, I don't know what to do about this stuff. You all are starting to do it already or have been doing it a long time. So hats off to you, to all of us. Thank you for sharing your moment of gratitude. You can keep them going. We're going to get back to our last couple of slides before we do Q&A. So, okay, bringing us to more of a sober place. You don't have to do more than read the papers these days to see the impact of climate change on our society where we live right now and, and all around the world, people are losing jobs, property, sickness, being forced to leave their homes, their countries. Emotions like fear, anger, very intense times that uh, aren't looking like they're going to let up anytime soon. And this loss of social connection. And for those of us that are activists, there's a real high rate of burnout. How do we keep ourselves feeling connected and strong and pacing ourselves? And I do believe that mindfulness practices can help with that. And in the links that you'll get after today, this is a whole other movement in librarianship is mindfulness. For instance, a Facebook group called Mindfulness for Librarians. Some of you are probably on it. I think that it has over three and a half thousand members of, on the Facebook group. So Let's just keep, you know, ourselves grounded so we can be available to ourselves, our families, friends, our communities that we serve. Next slide. So I picked out a handful of books. There are so many. If you go to like Goodreads and put in climate change and mental health, you get like 60 books. But I know these six, so I just wanted as examples to show that these are authors also doing things. So any of these you were to pursue, there's things like um, the one on the far upper right. So How to Live in a Chaotic Climate. That's Laura Schmidt, who started um, Good Grief Network. You can take courses with her and her colleagues to learn how to manage in a 10-step program. The one in the middle, Transformational Resilience, Bob Doppelt, is moving mountains in the Pacific Northwest and bringing the climate mental health challenge to legislators and offering uh, all kinds of programming that you can learn about. The one in the middle, All We Can Save, they have a whole writing, like book club program. Um, 
Joanna Macy and Chris Johnstone on the far left, that book Active Hope is filled with ideas for programming. Um, and I could go on, but all of these are, are authors doing things that you can learn from and adapt and use in your own communities. And I'm going to be really brief here because um, we want to also take some questions. So next slide. When you do some programming, um, if you're working with people that have been exposed to extreme weather, you'll want to take a trauma-informed approach to your programming. And there is a lot of library and other literature on this so that people coming into the spaces feel safe, like they have choices, that there's room for, for their voice, and that they feel that you're a trustworthy entity and that there's something also that they can do and ways to take care of themselves inside of the library space. So I just want to offer that lens. And then the last slide I have is very wordy. I want you to at least be familiar with this man, Bio Akomalafe. He is a Nigerian philosopher. Don't worry about all these words. It's quite maybe a different way of looking at the world, but it really is a loosening and a kind of um, facing our shadows as part of this that, you know, we can't just put a smile on it. We have to also realize like there is grief involved with this work and that there's a lot that we don't know and to learn how to lean into uncertainty. And I do believe we get stronger that way. So I'm going to end there and those slides will be available to you. Check out his stuff on YouTube. He's a very challenging, I think, and, and very um, eye-opening perspective on the way the world is changing. And is there one more slide? Oh, yeah. We're going to all go around and say what energizes us. I will begin. I'm on the bottom. I love walking labyrinths. If you go onto the web and look for the worldwide labyrinth locator, there are hundreds, thousands of light of labyrinths all around the world. And you can find them in your own neighborhood. And walking a labyrinth is very calming and opens you up to possibilities. Uh, who wants to go next? I can go if you want, because I'm upper left corner. Um, so that is a snowy owl that was at uh, West Dennis Beach. I, Gabrielle and I live on Cape Cod, and every year the snowy owls show up at West Dennis Beach, and you're always like, oh, is it going to be hard to find the snowy owls? And the answer is no. You show up and see where all the birders, what they're like, bajillion dollar, like huge binoculars are staring at the bird. Um, so what keeps me going is like being out in nature, going birding, seeing the animals and, and the plants that I love and thinking about like, hey, the stuff that I've been working on, like ideally will make it easier for this owl to not have a horrible go for the rest of its life. Um, yeah. And that shot was taken through. Um, if you hold your binoculars just right and put your iPhone up against the, the eyepiece, you can get shots like that. Like we were probably like 100 to 150 feet away from it. So kind of cool. And that's my part of this. Michelle, can you go next? Or Sure. Um, so my picture is the ocean there, and also in Dennis, um, where my family home is. My parents live down there. And I just love being in the water. I'll, I swim in the winter in a pool. And I love swimming in ponds in the ocean. And just the beach is my relaxing place, my happy place. So anytime I can get in the water, enjoy the sand and the sun, that's where I really feel nourished. I'm going to oh, pass over to Gabrielle. Thank you, Madeline, for the question and for everyone for sharing what energizes themselves. And for myself, um, this is a picture of my dog and myself. Um, actually, Uli's here with me. He's he's a Pomeranian, um, but we go for for bike rides. And um, same as same as um, as everyone else. And I would also just add to that. Um, knowing that we can slow down um, and that we can return to stillness and that the stillness is always there for us and that I feel like it also um, loves us. So those are things that bring me energy and keep me going. 
Thank you, everybody. Now we're on to Q&A, and Sarah, you're going to moderate that for us. I am. I first want to say thank you all for the presentation, and then to also say thank you for the reminder to take some time to uh, enjoy the world around us and remind ourselves why we do what we do. Um, so far, there hasn't been many questions in the chat. If anybody's got a question right now um, is the time. I do have one question from me while we wait to see if anybody has questions in the chat. And it's, you know, you talked a lot about specific programming, things that libraries have done, things that the network has done, but at, uh, the Blue Marble Librarians Network has done and fostered. But um, if people are sort of thinking about the model that the Blue Marble Librarians uh, present or work on, is there one word that you would want people to take with them to think about starting something similar? I will share the word organic. We didn't plan how it was going to all go. Like I said, an invitation, a presentation, a connection. We just sort of felt our way, and we didn't put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And I'm really proud of how far we've come without, like, making it so hard on ourselves. We've, we were very, very focused, very right-sized. Yeah, and I wanted to add on to that, I think, like, collaborative is one word and then also organized because we did a lot of organizing and i see us also as sort of like community organizers so those would be my two words would be collaborative and organized and i would add the word heart because we're all here because we we love each other and because we love uh the planet and our shared existence with all all beings. So that would be my word. And I'm going to say plants, because when you do programs and you give people free plants, they will show up to your programs. Uh, that plant can also be seeds. If you give people seeds, they will also show up. So if you're like, how do I get going on getting people involved? You give them plants. I like that Thanks. question, Sarah. Thank you. Um, any tips for implementing this kind of programming in a location where people are very resistant to talking about climate change um, and in that particular climate change as a, a term? Um, the Amanda was saying, was thinking, focusing on severe weather, which we definitely have where I live, might be a place to start. But if there are any other things to sort of get over that climate change hurdle that some people have. I think that's exactly why our collaboration has been successful because we focused on the extreme weather and there's no denying there's extreme weather. You can't possibly watch the news or be in this world right now without knowing there's extreme weather going on. So I feel like that's a great way is just focus on the extreme weather. There's no denying that. And it's very motivational too. And I think another way you kind of can get around sort of that's uh, some of that kind of issue is like if, if people are like sustainability, like that term's woke or whatever, organic, that term's woke. Um, sorry, if people hate that word, it sounds terrible when you say it out loud. I don't know if I've ever said it out loud. Um, if like I was saying, like I do programs on plants, I run seed libraries, I do these other things that are like adjacent to that, where if you offer that kind of programming without dropping like hot topic terms into it, you probably won't get a lot of pushback, you know, and I mean, Everyone loves to garden, so that's just what I'm here for. I'm just here to be like, grow things, and that's that's all I ever contribute to these Q&As, so. And I think I would also just add, um, just echoing some of what Madeline said earlier about the need for safety. Um, I highly recommend the book, Our Polyvagal World by um, Stephen and Seth Porges. Um, which looks at really nervous system regulation and our, our social interactions as these gateways, right, into nervous system regulation. And a lot of people, right, we live in a society in which, unfortunately, it's, you know, there's not necessarily a, an awareness 
right, of that. Um, so I think that when we focus on safety and when we focus on making people feel safe, that it really helps to create environments where people can engage with ideas and concepts that maybe they would normally not be um, open to. Um, but also remembering that there are always going to be detractors and people that you really just can't talk to because they're maybe just not in a place where they can be receptive. And it's okay to recognize that and to focus on the people who are receptive. Um, because I think our energy and our efforts are really best spent um, when we can identify that, but also that for people who are resistant, that so often that resistance comes from, you know, fear and hurt and a whole sort of also just complex of um, really systemic and it's not all, it's not all ignorance. It's, it's, you know, um, for anybody who follows Ibram X. Kendi's work, um, like stamped from the beginning, it's a justification for deeply in, entrenched racist policies um, that, that racism comes out of. And to me, climate change, um, racial justice, social justice, it's the same. It's one and the same stuff. So a couple of people are chiming in saying, you know, they have either um, some of the things that you were mentioning, the programming that doesn't necessarily say climate change, but is working towards some of those things. So um, I also wanted to put out that uh, Roz uh, included another idea for addressing climate slash environmental causes is hosting a rotating or permanent swap program. For example, their library offers a permanent puzzle swap and craft supply swap. People might not like talking about consumerism and climate, but who doesn't love a puzzle and a craft? Um, so that, you know, reduce, reuse part of the, the thing. And then there was a question, a follow-up question. Um, do you have any resources with suggested phrasing or ways to talk to others who don't necessarily believe in climate change? So, you know, there's a little bit of what Gabrielle was saying, um, you know, meeting people where they're at, things like that. But if there are any resources that you have that you'd like to share about that. So, and while you're thinking about that, I will also say that um, we will shortly be moving to our um, interactive portion um, for folks. This was scheduled for an hour and a half, but um, if you aren't staying for the interactive portion, the evaluation uh, link is not coming until the very end at the 4.30 mark. So just FYI for folks. Uh, so I, off the top of my head, can't think of any list that exists. I, I feel like half the time when I get put with these questions, when someone comes to me with like programming ideas or someone comes to me with like a problem about it, I just kind of wing it. And that's horrendous advice to give. Um, that's how I do it. So we have a lot of programming ideas on the guide and that section also includes like specific other resources like to ALA and um, so I can, I think we posted in the chat. I can post that again if that's helpful. Another idea is to go back onto the crew website and see past programs, because a lot of them did happen in libraries. So Michelle, if I can uh, get you to stop sharing and we will switch back. Good my Well, we could switch back if I knew where I put the uh, presentation window. Nope. 
that's your slides. Um, well, I try to find what I'm looking for. There we go. Um, Okay, after all of that, so our presenters talked a lot about a lot of examples of what they've done um, in their libraries as a network. Um, and in the chat, there was a lot of discussion about what other folks have already done. And so what we want to do with this time before us now is to really share some ideas. So things that folks have already done things that um, you're hoping to do in the future, things that you might want to get some um, input on. And so we're going to start off with Michelle is going to introduce a Padlet. So to start thinking about um, that and putting some ideas down in writing, and then we will uh, transition to some breakout rooms to continue the discussion. And then at the end of that, we will come back and do a little bit of wrap up and uh, have you on your way with hopefully some uh, energized to put into practice some ideas. So we want to give you the opportunity to share what you're doing and what you would like to do. Um, so we'd love to hear from you um, what's something big or small that you're doing that you'd like to or that you'd like to do to support climate preparedness and sustainability at your workplace or with other organizations in your community. So we have this Padlet, which April put the link in the chat. Um, to use the Padlet, just in case you haven't used a Padlet, you click on this little yellow plus sign at the bottom corner, and that brings up a little pencil, and that brings up a virtual sticky note, and then you can put your idea in there, um, whatever that may be. Maybe you wanted to do you know, a seed swap or something, and then you would type that and click publish, and that will bring up your sticky note. So we invite you to, we're gonna give you, um, we're gonna give you like three minutes to do that. Um, so we wanna also invite you, if you would, if you already got some ideas in there, that's fine, but if you could write now for ideas that you're already doing now, and then idea for what you'd like to do in the future. Um, if you already have ideas in there, just no worries about that, because I didn't share that quickly enough. Um, but if you could tag your other ideas with now colon for what you're doing already doing and then idea colon for things that you want to do in the future. And we're going to have three minutes for that starting now. And the link to participate in that activity is in the chat. So thank you for getting those ideas in there and things you're doing.
Okay, we're counting down one minute. Counting down 30 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And so now we're going to do a second part. We're going to have two minutes, and we're, we invite you to expand on ideas. Um, you can put any further thoughts you have, um, comment on other people's ideas. Um, you can comment on what's worked well um, and any resources that you may have found helpful. So I'm going to start the timer for two minutes, and that's just expanding on the ideas shared. To do that, you just click on the comment section um, under each uh, little virtual sticky note. And that's where you see that little blue logo. So I'll start the timer. We'll have two minutes to expand on the ideas. Counting down 30 seconds. In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one. Okay, thank you everyone so much for participating in that activity. Lots of great, lots of great ideas on there. Lots of great things you're already doing. Um, so we are now going to go into breakout sessions and we have a Google Doc um, that April just put in the chat. And you can still also refer to this Padlet in your sessions if you find it helpful. And so for our discussion, we are going to talk about what has your organization done to support climate preparedness, environmentalism, and sustainability, any program services, resources, and partnerships. Um, what climate preparedness and sustainability activities would you like to do in the future? And what kind of support could you use from your organization, from coworkers, from professional networks to do this work? Um, so if you wanna just click on that link, um, to make sure you have access to that. Um, I saw someone doesn't have access to that, so I'm gonna just copy and paste the questions to put in the chat for you. And we're just gonna expand on this conversation that we're already having. So Sarah's gonna pop us into breakout sessions and um, 
the leadership team will be divided up as facilitators for, for rooms. Thank you for attending today. Um, and I really appreciate people staying. Um, a lot of times when we say, oh, they're going to be breakout rooms, we get a lot of people who are like, no, I don't, I'm not sure I want to do that. But we actually had a very high percentage of folks say, um, stay and participate. And um, we really appreciate this because I think this is a very sort of proactive dynamic thing that we can do. Um, we definitely talked about the uh, mental health and the burnout that can come with this work, but, um, you know, being able to share the work with other people and to ask questions, I think is one of those things that can help with, um, you know, how we feel about what we're doing. So thank you um, to our presenters and thank you all for um, attending today. Um, if you are interested in claiming MLAC or CHIDC, um, the link should be in the chat. Um, as you take the evaluation, if you answer yes to wanting the CE, please make sure to pay close attention as a CE code and additional um, instructions will appear. Um, if you haven't already consider um, haven't already consider registering for upcoming sessions of the series. Uh, the next one is actually tomorrow afternoon at the same time. Time, and it is Understanding Environmental Health, a Social Ecological Model. And don't forget our company guide. So a lot of the links that were discussed um, will be on that guide as well. Um, each session has its own tab with information about the speaker and links to related information um, resources. The recordings will also be posted there if you want to refer back to it. Um, and the they will also be posted on our YouTube channel, and all of those links should be in the chat. Um, and if you are on social media and posting about the series, please uh, use hashtag SDOEH24, so folks who um, want to continue the conversation can find your post. And then once again, thank you so much to our speaker and thank you so speakers, and thank you so much for attending today's session. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.